Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is April 9th, uh, 2014, and we are um, happy to welcome Brenda Ball and Kara, Carrie James. Um, who uh, Brenda is a teacher who has had some students, and an administrator now, but um, from Vancouver, who has had some students on the um, working with the um, Out of Eden Walk um, business. <laughs> it is business. I mean, it's a lot of a lot of um, resources there, um, and we'll get into what that is just in a second. Chris Sloan um, said we should have these people on. Let's talk about this. And so, Chris, you can talk about that a little bit. Carrie mm -hmm. James is with us as well. Carrie James, you are a um, on the team, the education team, I guess. Uh, you can introduce yourself a little better than that, I think. Carrie, why don't you start? Introduce yourself, and um, we'll kind of get started here. Okay. Uh, so in, yeah. I, I am Carrie James. I am a sociologist and a researcher at Project Zero uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And um, my research, my work focuses mainly on young people's digital lives. So I've been involved in, in a couple of different research projects that have looked at how young people are responding to the affordances of the internet and how it's influencing their moral and ethical sensibilities, as well as how they're approaching civic and political participation. Mm. So those are two um, big areas of work for me and that really informed my um, thinking about this project um, Out of Eden Learn and I think I'll hold a minute and say more about what that is after we've all introduced ourselves. Great. Brenda, go ahead, welcome. Hi, thanks. I am a teacher and an administrator from Vancouver, Canada. So I'm at a new school this year um, where I have both teaching and administrative duties and the school I'm at this year is an international school so I have students not only from Canada but from Asia, Africa, Europe and previously last year when I was also involved in Out of Eden I was at an all-girls university prep school so I have um, been working it with it in two different contexts. Cool. Chris, welcome. Hi. Introduce um, yourself and speak of your interest a little bit. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City. And um, I just came across Out of Eden maybe like two weeks ago. Uh, and since then, I've been um, really intrigued with it because, um, like Carrie mentioned, for years, I think, and Paul, we've been doing this for years, uh, our work with youth on youthvoices.net. Um, trying to get students to, um, you know, discuss things in rational and um, civic ways um, has been, you know, a focus for a while. And we've been linking with different classrooms around the world. Um, and so when I came across this particular thing, uh, you know, Paul walking, how do you say his last name, Paul? Hello, Pick. Is that, is that right? That's right, Salopec. 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 Okay. Salopec. So you know he's taking this seven-year walk across the world, and um, and then Carrie's work linking students or you know creating this community for students around that walk really um, appealed to me because of you know the kinds of work we've been doing with youth around the country mostly, but you know some from around the world for a number of years. And and can I say that I think I I will apologize with my fumbling introduction here by saying that once I started seeing all the different sites that are involved, it's a pretty complex project. Um, so can you maybe start at the center and say what the is? It's a National Geographic project, is that right? Um, and and then move out into the Learn projects, the educational projects. Does that make sense, Carrie? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So. Um, so Paul Salopak is a um, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, and he, um, I think more than 10 years ago, came up with the idea for doing this, this incredible walk following in the footsteps of our ancestors one of the, and following one of the dominant migratory pathways out of Africa um, and then across the globe. So he conceived of this walk 
and he saw it as an exercise in slow journalism. He felt like this was an important counterpoint to the sort of media frenzy, 24-7 media cycle that, um, you know, that is really a part of our lives today. So he really wanted to slow down the pace of reporting to a sort of more human pace, like that of our ancestors. So walking through the world was his way, you know, his, his thought about how best to do this. And, and, and his project is really about storytelling. Um, his goal in slowing down and walking through places is that by walking, by, by moving slowly through the world, you meet different kinds of people and you can then reveal the hidden stories that otherwise um, you would just drive past or fly over. So it's a really fascinating, really radical notion, especially um, in our contemporary context where we tweet in 140 characters and Paul tweets, you know, not to say that he objects to it, um, but really trying to slow down and reveal the complexities of our lives and also seeing the deep past as a sounding board or a way of, of looking at the contemporary problems that plague us. So that's Paul. So Paul's work, he set off on foot in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia January 10th, 2013. Um, when he planned the walk, he anticipated it would take him seven years. But he always, you know, he always says that, you know, that time frame is uncertain. Um, he has a, a rough path, and at some point I have, a, I have some slides or I can shift to his site and I can sort of display the map of his route or, or people can find it at outofedenwalk.com. Um, so Paul's route is, is contingent, but he, but he has a rough plan. Um, and he is reporting from the field in a couple of different ways through the National Geographic website. Um, Paul posts dispatches, what he calls dispatches from the field every week or so, and the pace varies a little bit. Um, and those are shorter passages, really observing the things that he's seeing. And, and if you start to read some of his dispatches, you'll see that he's an incredibly poetic writer. He's a beautiful, um, beautiful writer and observer of the world and an incredible storyteller. So that'll just give you, you know, immediately a sense of what Paul's all about. Um, he also has, an, there is another site, a companion site, um, called outofedenwalk.com. And on that, there, he posts what he calls milestones. Every 100 miles, Paul takes a photograph of his feet. He takes a photograph of the sky. He does a panoramic shot. He takes a soundscape and, and I believe, a videoscape. And then he goes up to the first person he sees, who he comes across as he's walking, and he asks them the same three questions. What is your name? Where are you coming from and where are you going? And he posts those milestones on the outofedenwalk.com site along with some other pieces, some other stories from the field. The incredible thing about that site is there's a, an amazing mapping tool that you can, it's a very interactive map and you can dive into his dispatches or you can go, um, you know, you can zoom out and see um, the plan for the entire walk. It's, it's pretty incredible. And that, um, that site is supported by the Knight Foundation. So there are a couple of, those are the, some of the bodies that are involved in supporting Paul's walk itself. Brenda, am I leaving anything out from the Paul side of the story? Not from the Paul side, just the learn side. Okay, so getting to the learn side. So, so when Paul was planning his walk, he spent a couple of months at the Neiman Foundation at Harvard, um, and he he always knew that he wanted uh, some sort of broader legacy for the walk. He wanted in some way to connect with young people. And he, you know, really discerned that there were great learning potentials associated with this walk. So Paul got in touch with Shari Tishman, who was at that time the director of Project Zero. And she was really intrigued by Paul's walk because Shari, for a long time, I mentioned that I came at this work from having done a lot of research in in young people's digital lives, Shari Tishman 
have been spending a long time thinking about and researching the concept of slow, slow looking, and how and, and the value of slow looking and slow learning. So Paul's concept of slow journalism totally clicked with her her interests. And then Shari immediately thought of Liz Dawes DeRising, who had just completed the doctoral program at the Ed School at Harvard and had done her her doctoral work on how young people um, develop historical consciousness, how they think about their identities in the context of a broader human story. And so that really fit with the historical origins of Paul's walk. So the three of us sort of came together and decided that we should develop a project that really built on the learning potentials of Paul's Walk. And we were fortunate enough to get funding from the Abundance Foundation, which is a Bay Area foundation, to develop a learning community. We wanted to do something online, something that drew on and mimicked some of the things that Paul's doing in the field, um, but really brought it, you know, brought to it some other issues that we were interested in, themes that we were working on anyway. So it was a nice click. I should say that Paul has a couple of other education partners. It's not just us, the Pulitzer Center, um, who they're also a supporter of Paul's Walk. Um, they have some curricular materials as well. They're, they exist online, but they're materials that you print off. They're sort of, um, they're not embedded in an online community, but they're excellent materials that really pull from um, the spirit of Paul's Walk. I, I used uh, today uh, his his welcome to students from there. Oh, fabulous! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's another <coughs> fantastic resource, the Pulitzer Center at work. Mm -hmm. um, National Geographic also has an education piece. They have some curricular materials on their site. So the three of us um, are the main education partners for Pulse Walk, and we've each sort of taken the core concepts of what Paul's doing and gone in a little bit of different direction with each of them. That's a, so that's a big picture. <laughs> that's a good introduction. Great. Can, um, can you address I, my sixth graders? Um, it was fun to say to them, you know, he started this trip in 2013 and he thinks it's going to take him seven years. Um, and when are you going to graduate from high school? Um, so they're going to be with him all through school, which is kind of fun. Um, but yeah. uh, yeah, uh, so that you know, they're they're kind of amazed. Um, but the, some of them are asking, well, why does he care about kids? So you address that a little bit, but can you expand that a little bit? What was what's his passion about connecting with education? Well, I, I mean, I, I I guess it just goes back to what I said before that um, I think Paul, I mean, Paul went Paul's a, at root. He's a journalist, but he's a storyteller. And I think that he sees the power of stories for learning, for learning, for learners of all ages. I, I guess is how you put it. So I think young people in particular, because of the stage that they're at, and I think in the the moment they're growing up right now in this sort of world where we have so much information coming at us, um, the the idea of slowing down and really to a sort of walking pace and really deeply observing our surroundings is something that's an incredibly rich counterpoint to the way many people, especially young people, lead their lives today. And I don't want to I don't want to put words in Paul's mouth, but the mouth because I don't know if he would say the exact same thing if you asked him. But I think that his concept of slow journalism that's a part of it. And he really, he, he really came to us and wanted to understand. I think he knew that there were great learning potentials in what um, he was doing, but he's not an educator. That's not his field. And he wanted to work with folks like us in Pulitzer and National Geographic who cared about young learners and could think about some um, really creative ways to pull um, some key ideas from his walk and build some learning experiences around it. I don't know if you want to add anything, Brenda. Brenda, go ahead, yeah. Um, in terms of Paul, what, why Paul is doing and connecting with kids? Well, I guess... Whatever you want I, to, yeah. <laughs> go okay. ahead. Yeah. Well, the way I perceive it is that um, 
And I, sh I would just want to preface this by saying the whole reason I'm connected with this is because of social media, because I used to be heavily involved in social studies chat on Mondays, um, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, I haven't been able to be involved this year because I always have administrator meetings on Mondays, but so I've been out of the loop since September. But that's how I met Liz. Can't chat Liz under the table? Come on. <laughs> I wish I could. Um, and so I met Liz through Twitter originally, and so I mention that only because uh, I, this interesting connection with social media, the fastness of social media, the rapidity, but at the same time this concept of slow journalism, and I, the beauty of it as I see um, Paul's slow journalism being able to be used in this fast way and, and you know, trying to combine these two. So um, I, I just see it as an opportunity. I, I don't know his motivations necessarily, but I really see the opportunity and potential for students to really, I've noticed because I've been doing this for two years now and I was also involved before um, Liz and, and Carrie and Shari's project got connected with um, the Out of Eden Walk. Um, and seeing how the footsteps and, and the, thing, the way students get involved, how it is have affected how they look at things and how it's affected how I look at things too. So um, I don't know what his intentions or motivations are, but I can definitely see that there's been an impact not only on students but on me. Yeah, and I would add to that uh, long journalism kind of talk too because I've taught journalism for a long time in high school. And um, now, you know, it's kind of morphed into a class I call New Media. And um, for a long time, the, the long stories were getting pushed aside because it was expensive to print those. Um, and so, you know, with the advent, I mean, I'm going back here, but, you know, when USA Today started to make its impact on print journalism, that filtered down to high schools. And so we started thinking like, oh, you know, you've got to keep your story short. You'll lose readers' attention, you know, if, if you make it too long. Uh, and so we started to adjust and, um, you know, I started missing this these long stories, but where were they? They were in few and far between places. Uh, and so now there's this resurgence, it seems like, in part due to, I think, tablets. Um, you know, so uh, things like out of Eden, and then earlier this year, Paul Allison, you know, the work with Dasani, that New York Times story that was in five parts. Um, there was this uh, great story of, um, I went. I think it won a Pulitzer maybe last year or two years ago, the um, the avalanche or the, the you know, in, um, I think it was a New York Times story um, about this big storm in Washington, this multimedia piece, and and so there's this resurgence of long-form journalism. Even the the guy I forget his name right now, who who's one of the co-founders of Twitter, now he has this site called Medium.com. Evan Williams, I think, is his name. And Medium.com is another attempt to bring back this longer-form journalism. And there's really some beautiful stuff on Medium.com. Uh, but this was developed by the guy who wanted one touch kind of publishing short stuff but he's starting to realize now it's like wait there's more to it uh, this long form is making a resurgence and so that's intriguing for me as a media teacher and as an English teacher to find a place for these things that take longer to put together and longer to read and think about um, let me introduce Jake Jacobs who's here with us as well he's an art teacher um, so uh, welcome Jake and he, we teach in the same room. <laughs> Are you there yet? Your mic's not working yet. I don't know. Can't hear you. Well, he'll work on that. All right. Yeah. So uh, just to identify, you you did connect long and and slow there, right? They're not necessarily the same, but yeah, I can see the overlap, right, Chris? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I mean, and and one of the ways I would describe it, uh, having looked at it now for a week. Um, and I and I, I I feel like how come I haven't seen this before? But that's okay. Um, <laughs> but the um, one of the uh, you know the Common Core standards reduces genre right to some something like three genres. There's narrative, informational, and argument right. Um, but when you look at um, what um, the Out of Eden work is doing, there's all sorts of genre going on there. 
here. Um, you know, there, there, there are digital postcards. There, so there's and there's a lot of experimentation with with how you tell the story um, over time. Uh, so the, there's the mapping. You know, so I, if you start listing them, it's it's pretty amazing how many different things there are. How does is there like a team of people trying to make this happen, or how does Paul do all of that? I mean, he can't, right? <laughs> and do the traveling too. Do you know Carrie or? Um, yeah, he. I mean, he does have a. He has. Um, I mean, he, yeah, he certainly does have a team of of people who support his work. Nas National mm -hmm. Geographic. Um, they provide support. He has um, some folks at MIT at the Media Lab who um, work on the out of Eden out of Eden Walk .com site and also support the social media piece. So uh, my sense, I, I'm, my thinking is Paul does his, his, his own tweets, but um, Out of Eden Walk um, gets support from a team. Um, so he, he, and he definitely, you'll see some interesting posts on Out of Eden Walk in his lab talk section of the Out of Eden Walk yeah. site where he, he actually crowdsources for advice um, about you know how to keep his laptop battery charged using a solar power char charger and mm -hmm. um, so he draws on 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 the you know the the worldwide audience that he's developing around the walk for their expertise um, when he's traveling um, when he, when he's walking he has um, Local guides, um, you know, people he develops very close relationships with. And they walk with him for weeks, if not months. Um, so he he has a team, but I mean, it's there's there's not a massive organization behind Out of Eden Walk. I mean, it's a pretty you know bare bones um, outfit. And Paul, I mean, Paul is pretty he's pretty incredible. I mean, you'll see just looking at the the volume of, of writing he's done in the past year as he's been walking. He's a prolific writer. Um, he's also as committed as he can be to every piece of the walk. So um, in a couple of weeks time, I believe it's April 29th, Paul will be doing a Google Hangout on air um, with educators of Out of Eden Learn. And he's done a couple of um, Google Hangouts specifically for students and teachers, and so he really tries to um, to be a part of that piece in addition to to doing other things for other audiences associated with the walk. Yeah, one of the oh, sorry, just want to mention one of the cool forms that he puts up um, is he collects tweets and other social media around the area and and collects those. That that's quite a snapshot that we've never had before in a particular area to look at. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it's, it becomes a part of his storytelling in a way. Right. Yeah. Not the traditional storytelling, but another another facet of it. Yeah. Yeah, I was Chris, curious while we're talking, talking organization. I was curious about the organization then around just out of Eden Learn, because. Mm -hmm. We as a can teacher, focus there. Yeah. Now, interested in getting involved in that, and I've been able to sign up. So, um, you know, how does that work for, let's say, a teacher who's interested in joining now? Um, you know, how do they go about joining, and what kinds of things would they expect? So they they go to the um, learn.outofedenwalk.com site, um, and we can post that on the chat pad. I think. Um, yeah. If it's not there already, I think it is there already. Uh, already, okay. Yeah. Um, and there's a you know sort of a couple of you know it, there's a pretty clear set of easy steps. But you 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 register your course and we ask your class we ask for some information. I should say that that participants don't just include teachers and students in traditional schools. We have um, we have some young people who've joined as independent learners. Um, and we have a number of um, families that homeschool their children, so we have a couple of homeschool walking parties. I think the the most common um, participants are students in um, in schools, but we have other other ways of uh, participating. So um, when a 
a teacher wishes to join, they, they give us some information. Um, and then we've set up recently enrollment periods, um, which we think are a better way of doing it rather than as, because it, it takes a little while to form what we call the walking parties. The concept is that once you join with your class of students, you get assigned to a walking party that includes five or six, sometimes seven, um, other classrooms. Ideally, they're scattered in different places across the globe. So you, you are assigned to a walking party that includes classrooms in other parts of the world. Um, so it's by design, you're in this cross-cultural, international group of, it ends up being, you know, 80 to 90. Some, some, of the, some of the walking parties are smaller, some are bigger, just um, because of how we, the numbers of people who, who go to sign up. And then, um, and then you, you know, the teachers are given a sort of overview of what's to come, some information to help them prepare and think about, um, think about their next steps. And then we have a certain date. We started this recently, the launching, where we launched the walking parties. Now, initially, the idea was that the learning journey, which is the term we use for our curriculum, which is composed of footsteps, um, trying to really go with the walk theme there. The, re the original thinking was that the, the classes would all be doing the same footstep at the same time. But of course, you know, that's not the way it turned out because, you know, in, in, in Australia, they're off on, um, on a spring break and, you know, in California, they're doing exams. And so, so everyone's sort of at a different, um, slightly different pace, but that ends up being an asset because the students who get to, the, to a footstep first and post their work first, then when they come back, you know, maybe they go off on a break, they come back and they're excited to go back and look at the student work that's been posted since from other um, students in classrooms and other places. So it, it actually um, facilitates reflection, going back to their work and to the work of others and reflecting on it, um, and then going to the, the next footstep or activity that we're asking them to do. Brenda, do you want to fill in anything from the teacher perspective of um, how you get your students involved in Out of Eden Learn? Yeah, so I do it in my traditional classroom setting. So we try to uh, once a week or once every 10 days um, do one of the footsteps. But um, last year, the walking party that I was with, or my classes were with, um, we had a very large one from a wide spectrum across the globe. So students in India, Australia, the UK, United States, Canada. And it was really rich having all those different perspectives. But like Carrie says, um, you know, we are at different time um, inputting our reflections because of different school schedules, etc. Um, this year... Brenda's freezing, but... Maybe she'll come back. It works quite well with um, my school schedule this year and, and things like that. So it's great because we get to have um, connections with students around the globe, which is the really enriching part, I think, for my students um, last year and this year. Can you can you paint a picture for us a little bit about that, like a, a student who, you know, got really excited or learned something meaningful because of that connection? Well, I'll, I'll give you an ex two examples from um, a couple of the footsteps. One of the footsteps is to take photographs uh, of things, either things that are a very typical view of your day or something really up close and micro that you might not have noticed before. So really slowing down and paying attention. So I've done this um, footstep a couple of times last year and this year. And I love this activity because it really makes people, including me, <laughs> stop and think about the world around us. But the, the secondary part, the really complimentary part, is when the students post their photos and why they posted it, um, then they get reflections from other people around the world. And, of course, they get to see students in India's photos that they posted, and students from the UK who post their photos. And it really makes you realize how globally connected we are and how similar we all are. And I always say, and one of the other things, as Carrie was talking about um, Paul being a storyteller, you know, 
everybody has a story. And we would all understand each other a lot better if we slowed down and listened to people's stories. And so this was really an opportunity for students to see through images and hear through reflections um, other people's stories. And it was really enlightening and eye-opening um, for my students to see uh, some of the images coming out of India because they had maybe a perception of what it was like to be uh, a student in India and our school, uh, actually I was taking a group of students to India last spring and so they were quite excited about seeing what the students from India were saying and they all said to me, because they were the students in India were about three years younger than my students, they are like, they're so smart, like mm -hmm. I feel kind of not so smart next to them because of the way they speak and they're so, their vocabulary is amazing and, and uh, look at where they live, it looks so cool and you know I think it's just myth busting which is what I really like. Um, so I really like that activity. One of the other activities is just to look at images from around the globe and, and kind of dissect them and to see um, how it demonstrates globalization and you know why I like that activity is because you could take some of these pictures and it could be Vancouver, it could be Johannesburg, it could be Mexico City and I think that tells us something as well that um, about global connections so um, but it's the it's the reflection of our students first on their own work and then their reflection on what they see other students around the world doing and at the same time um, reading some of Paul's work which as Carrie said is just absolutely poetic and beautiful and you complement that with the images it's just amazing and such an enriching experience for the students. Mm -hmm. Carrie I have a I don't I kind of thank you <laughs> Brenda um, I don't know if you'll be able to fill this but maybe um, in your research it seems that you've looked at kids posting stuff everywhere, right? like all over. Um, but in this case, in this, um, students are posting within uh, a kind of protected space, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. so what's your reflection on on that? You know, are, are, you know, are kids posting out in the world about, you know, um, out of Eden 2? What would that look like? Or why the need for this space? Yeah. Well, uh, well, a couple of, of thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. One, you know, to respond to that last question you threw in, why the need for this space? I think it really relates to um, a, a, a phrase that Brenda just used, myth busting. Um, mm -hmm. One, you know, one of the big problems about um, social media and the internet are filter bubbles or echo chambers. The fact that regardless of, of the reality that the internet can, can allow us to be exposed to diverse perspectives, the fact is we end up friends on Facebook with people who are a lot like us or we follow people on Twitter um, who may be more similar to us than different. So yeah, That's true of young people too or probably um, even I, I think it is true of young people, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's I don't think it's true of everyone across the board. I think mm -hmm. there are, we can find examples where people do broaden their their you know perspectives on the world. They get exposure to diverse perspectives, but I think that um, we should be reflecting more carefully about filter bubbles and um, and who we're dialoguing with online and whether we're really getting. Um, exposure to um, to new ideas that forward our understandings. So on the one hand there are filter bubbles but then on the other hand when we're not in filter bubbles um, some, I, I think a lot of time on the internet you see dialogue break down into incivility and conflict and so when you do see diverse perspectives, opinions, and ideas brought to the fore, you know, there ends up being tension. And not that tension is bad, not that disagreements are bad, it's when they devolve into incivility that um, it can become problematic. And so some of the work that um, we've been doing on young people who are civically active um, has found that some of them over time end up pulling back from expressing their civic or political 
ideas and activities, really robust stuff that they're doing offline, that they initially are sharing on Facebook and Twitter, they end up pulling back from it in part because of backlash and hmm. um, a lack of efficacy about how to handle it. Um, and so we've got these these sort of interesting issues that have come to the fore on the web. And so in terms of the need for Out of Eden Learn, I think that a community like this that's relatively safe or closed, that provides an opportunity to have intercultural communication um, about topics that you know, I think are meaningful, that allow people to explore their identities and really exchange with others, can be a good, um, I don't want to say training ground, but it can be a good sort of oasis in what otherwise might feel like, on the one hand, a social popularity contest on Facebook, um, and on the other hand, a, a sort of group of strangers in an online forum who sometimes become hostile to one another. So I think it can be a really exciting space. And you asked if youth within the community are talking about Out of Eden Walk um, beyond it. And you know that's something we don't know the answer to, but we really want to understand that. And the other thing that I really want to understand is are they taking the habits of mind that we're trying to inculcate, um, that we're trying to encourage in Out of Eden Learn, and applying those to how they interact with others in other communities like Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and across the web. Yeah. Wow, fascinating answers. And and I I I almost Chris and I were talking just uh, a week or two ago about noticing students pulling back just like you were saying from social media as they get more involved in in their own civic work and so forth. So that's that's really interesting. That you notice that too. Can I add something yeah. here? Sure. Um, I just wanted to say I, uh, one of the other um, tech ed tech gurus that I really appreciate is Amy Burval, who works in Hawaii, and she uses the hashtag Dare to Share a lot. And so I really I think that the closed online space really allows the students to get used to daring to share, sharing their work in a positive way so that they can become accustomed to building kind of a positive digital footprint because mm -hmm. it is, you know, something that they have to learn and practice with media literacy and, um, you know, they're growing up in an era, an age where everything is archived online about what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're saying, and what they're posting and so this gives them an opportunity to really do something um, positive for the most part, it's positive and, um, and reflective and then something they can be proud of as well. And so I'd like to see them do more where they're posting things and being proud of posting things and building a positive digital footprint. So, you know, down the road, universities, employers will be able to look at some of their work that they've created. And I've noticed that some of my students, you know, especially after um, the footstep this year, um, because I have international students who are taking photographs of Vancouver and saying, oh, you know, like, this is my view, or this is what I see out of my dorm room, or this is um, really beautiful, and we don't have snow where I come from, and so, you know, it was really great the first time I saw snow in Vancouver. And th then they get some reaction from people around the globe, and they really like it, and so then they'll share it also on their Instagram or Tumblr, or whatever mm -hmm. account they have. And um, and so they, they kind of get a little bit of courage um, out of, and confidence in, you know, it's okay to not just always try to be cool with what I'm posting on my um, digital sites, my social media sites, but I can do something that's reflective and intellectual as well. Yeah. And, uh, um, go ahead, Bruce. You know, if you think about some of the posts already that Paul has done, you know, they, they center around poverty. Um, they center around um, uh, environmental issues, um, and these are pretty hot topics. When you think about these things, the way they're discussed in social media spaces, you know, a lot of times there's flaming about, you know, think gl global warming discussions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and anything where you start to talk about uh, income inequity or poverty, which is really the substance of a lot of what I'm seeing in Paul's stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I live in the American West, and so his work on drought and uh, water 
rings true with my students. And, and I think those subjects that he's writing about, those could potentially be flashpoints where, you know, like a student might say something that could be easily misinterpreted by a student in, in India about wealth or, or wherever, right? Um, and so I think thinking about how we um, discuss things civilly, this seems like a good place to do that, especially with what's got to be happening uh, soon because he's going to be going through, like, I don't know when, next year or after that, Syria, Iran. Um, you know, there's going to be some issues there that just naturally invite what could be uncivil dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what I like is um, Carrie's work about anticipating that and being ready for that. Mm -hmm. So how, okay, just, uh, uh, I want to keep going with the, the larger pedagogical question, but um, the, how open or closed is the site actually? Can you see everything that's in your wa walking party, is that right? Or, mm -hmm. like, could I go there and see how the students work right now? I, no. I, it was, okay. Yeah, so, um, and if you registered with a cor with a class... I did, by the way, and, and somebody very politely said, we're setting it up, give me a couple of days, so yeah. it might have been you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Once you join, you'll be able uh -huh. to see the work of all of the students in your walking party, uh -huh. um, but you won't be able to see what's going on in other walking parties. Okay. So they're semi, semi public spaces, I guess, in this broader... Mm -hmm. um, well, what was the thinking of that? The... Well, the thinking of that is to make sure that we're... Um, I think that we have communities of a reasonable size so that mm -hmm. in terms of commenting on each other's work that we have a good chance of really perhaps developing a, a sense of community. And I think that, you know, Brenda can speak to this um, probably in a more concrete way, but I know from the interviews we conducted, we've conducted so far with participants in different stages of Out of Eden Learn that the one thing they really like is interacting with the other students. And so I think that even developing connections with particular students um, I think that sort of thing is more possible when you're in smaller communities mm -hmm. within a larger platform rather than having it be completely open and you're seeing random you know, work from potentially you know, 500, 1,000 students um, scattered in different places around the world. So, and do the ahead. teachers in those walking communities also communicate? Or? They, they I do. Uh -huh. you, do you want to jump in, Brenda, on this? Well, sure. I'll, I'll speak more to last year because last year um, we had quite a communication going on between the teachers. I have to admit on the last walking party that I was involved in from January till just recently, I didn't communicate at all with the other teachers um, within the walking party, but I did communicate with the students because when I saw reflections or interesting comments made, I, I like to join in too without being too intrusive. Um, so, uh, but I, to go back to your original question, Paul, what Carrie was answering, I think that too large a group would make it almost like a deluge of um, re, uh, of things to read, and I think it might um, turn some students off from participating in some ways because there'd just be too many things there to respond to. So, having a, a, a an appropriate sized group um, makes it more manageable. So, when I can say, okay, go and look at you know, five or six um, reflections and make a comment on a few of them that you find interesting or unusual or um, whatever. But if, if there were 500, I, they wouldn't know where to start and when to stop. And that's, I think, the challenge with being open to everybody. I, I think. I don't know. I can only speak because on the, on the last walking party, we had a smaller group, and it was very manageable that way. One thing we try to do, Paul, um, though, is share... We have a, a curated gallery of student work. I noticed that, yeah. On the site, and so that's mm -hmm. that's our mechanism for sharing some of what's happening with within the community. Um, the other thing that's a recent addition to our platform is that we've created an educator forum and a place uh, a place for educators to post resources, either um, 
spin-offs of some of the footsteps or their remixes or their reflections about how they built um, the learning journey or particular footsteps into um, their subject matter or their, um, their learning arc for the year. And so um, it's relatively new, but we're, um, we're excited to see um, that really become a space for communication across across walking parties, you know, between educators across walking parties, and ultimately, hopefully, for youth to um, to post some some ideas about things that they might like to do beyond the out of Eden learn learning journey that they experience a semester or one year. So uh, we said at the beginning, but just to identify, Chris and I are involved, are involved in this Youth Voices community that's mainly supported, um, not totally, but a lot of uh, National Writing Project teachers are on it um, throughout the country. And so there are about a dozen schools in New York and about a dozen throughout the country. Um, I like to say those numbers keep m m getting messy, though. So, and just to give a... a Quick example, and, and I'm going to get to a, a thought or a question here in a second, of how we, we started. Um, it, Chris's students went on and just, uh, Chris, I think they looked at um, the dispatches, Paul's dispatches, mm -hmm. and, and read a couple of them or one of them and just wrote a, a few paragraphs about that. And they put that on Youth Voices. And then, and then we put mm -hmm. that up on a, on a page that's at youthvoices.net, um, out of Eden 1, um, slash out of Eden 1. And my students are finding Chris's students and, and, and then reading the same dispatch and then comment, they're going to be hopefully commenting back and forth with each other. Oh, so we're, we're, we're trying to figure some of that out. So, yeah. but, and then our question was like, all right, community within community, how, you know, we're, <laughs> we're this community, but then we'd love, to, we, we love the work of that community too. So how, how do, like, bridge all those communities is one of the things we'll be figuring out. We don't have to figure it out ahead of time. But but I just want to say, all, all the stuff you said about, um, like, a, a quick example I'll say is that when we ask students, like, how does being on Youth Voices compare to being on Facebook, they tell us that, um, you know, Youth Voices is a place where I can be me. Um, by that, they mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, they're not, you know, putting up this persona of something and being all that all the time, they can kind of, like like Brenda, like you said earlier, they can, you know, do other things and make, be vulnerable and and be schooly sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, so I babbled there, but uh, can you help us think about, you know, being a community within a community? Chris, if you have something to add about that, is that fair to say? Community. With I don't know. Community. I mean, how did you imagine like joining? Like, we can double post and do stuff like that, right? No problem. But how did you imagine being in both communities with kids, or what were you thinking already? Right. Uh, well, I'm asking uncomfortable questions here, but I don't think. No, no, that's a comfortable <laughs> question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because uh, what I've realized, you know, in teaching more and more is, uh, you know, the more social my classroom becomes, the more things I connect with, uh, the p more powerful the learning is. For years, writing teachers have been saying, you know, audience is a big consideration. So, you know, like I would say, audience is a big deal, guys. Let's think about audience in the 80s, you know. So they'd write their things on paper to me, and we would imagine audiences, or sometimes we would push our stuff out, like maybe to a letter to the editor, or that kind of thing. But the idea of interacting with real audiences um, seems to motivate my students, right? So the way I perceive the current photography class, I teach English and media and photography. So photography, um, they their typical cycle is they shoot a particular concept. Last you know week it was spring break. They upload their stuff to Flickr, yet another community, right? And sometimes they have discussions with photographers on Flickr. Mm -hmm. Well, then they embed those photos on Youth Voices and typically talk about what they tried to do with this photo, um, you know, how it was different, their conception of the photo with the reality of the photo, um, where they were, that kind of thing. And so that seems like a still a legitimate thing to do and discuss on Youth Voices. Now this is another community that's built around this man who's walking around the world who also has these really good photographers with him, 
and he so, is himself. A wonderful and he guy. takes photos too. But I think there there's at least another person who's featured on on the site. Mm -hmm. His photography. So I mean, as a photo teacher, I thought, and that's not the only communities these pho photographers participate in. They you know they also do National Geographic. Um, work where they'll post stuff and discuss it there. So one community doesn't preclude another. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes they post similar things in different places. But um, it just strikes me that if, if you're a photographer today, you want, your, you want people to see your work and maybe even repurpose your work. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to do that unless you commit to a lot of different communities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's exciting. It's exciting for me to hear uh, already about your students, uh, you know, writing about Out of Eden, the walk, and Out of Eden Learn within Youth Voices. And so that's the kind of thing I mentioned before, this sort of research question about how, how youth take their experiences within Out of Eden Learn and how those experiences inform what they do elsewhere following that or trying to follow the legacy of this experience or what they're bringing into Out of Eden Learn from these other communities. Chris has mentioned that they're, they're a part of on Flickr, the, you know, the insights mm -hmm. gained from there. Um, it's a really interesting connected learning question. Mm. How would you characterize then Out of Eden Learn's, I don't know, ethos, community? Is that possible? I mean, it is about the slow learning, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So... And the respect and, yeah. Yeah, I, are, you, are you asking about the sort of um, the habits of mind we're looking to cultivate? The, sure, that's... Yeah, yeah I so think, I, I yeah. think um, there are a couple of different things we're after, and the first one you just mentioned, which is slow, really developing um, a capacity as well as a disposition which I think is more important than the capacity piece, to slow down, right? to be inclined to move through the world a little bit more slowly and to be more observant about one's surroundings and to really listen carefully to other people. And so the first um, piece is slow. Um, the second, this, these map on to different aspects of the learning journey. Um, I keep mentioning the learning journey, and if folks want to see that um, at the top of the of our Out of Eden Learn site, there's a thing, there's a box that says curriculum, I think, and it's just a two-pager that gives you an overview. So, Carrie, can I just, sorry, quickly say this, the same experience you had of, the we, we have over and over again, like, okay, could we do things together, but then, you know, they fall apart. So what you said earlier, it totally echoes with, with our experience, too. But I, that that is a great list there, those footsteps. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, a, and it's a great to get a sort of high level of what, what this is about and how it might fit in with your other learning goals in your classroom. Mm -hmm. So so slow is one thing. The other thing is, um, is really trying to become more attuned to um, complexity in the world and the fact that we live, like Brenda gave those really beautiful examples of the photographs really showing the photographs students took themselves and then compared with other students and the photographs they they analyzed, really revealing that we live in a globally inter interconnected world, that um, sometimes it's hard to tell um, where a photograph is shot, and you can see signs that we live in a global world. So that piece. And, you know, based on Liz work, Liz's work, I mentioned Liz Dawes de Rising, who, um, who's, who's such a key architect of this whole project, um, you know, her work was on historical consciousness, so really um, pushing all of us and young people in particular to understand how the life they're leading and the life they're, they expect to lead is connected to a larger human story. How what has become, what has come before them really informs the life they're leading today. So doing that historical reflection as well as becoming more attuned to the broader global context. And then the last piece relates to um, a theme that we talked about um, related to dialogue, which is like intercultural communication and competence, really being able to um, 
share perspectives, develop a sense of curiosity about people who live in very different places, and be able to detect um, similarities and differences and talk across those differences with respect and in ways that deepen your understanding of both who you are and who other people are. Hmm. That's great. I don't know if you want to add anything, Brenda? Yeah, Brenda, go ahead. Jump in. When you're speaking, it just reminded me of one of the activities, which is to interview somebody who is of a different generation, an older generation. And that was also a really enlightening uh, task, not just the interview itself, which I think um, adds a lot of value. You know, I teach social studies, so we talk about continuity and change and ethical dimensions and really trying to push skills over content, um, even though we have standardized exams that we have to um, complete at the end of the course. But um, my students invariably interviewed their parents or grandparents relatives, somebody close within their family. Maybe if they were daring, they interviewed their neighbor. And one of the students, I think, in India was interviewed the taxi driver and was talking to the taxi driver, asking questions or whatever. And so my students had said afterwards, after reading the interview and what the student learned, they said, wow, like I would have never interviewed a stranger and I said okay well let's think about that for a while what what is it about our culture that we're very closed or nervous that we we don't talk to people that we don't know what, what part of culture has made us to be that way and, and why is it not the same in other places and what does that say about us and uh, so to we, we can become reflective of our own culture and you know that adds to intercultural understanding I think because now I'm working in an international school where we have students from everywhere and they are so enlightened because they are constantly working with people who are coming from different languages, but our common language is English now. And but you know, learning that in some countries a smile means something different than in other countries, and if you know, and and just those little bits and pieces that you would never possibly get if you don't travel or don't go to an international school, or you know, how else can you get it? But now with digital media, we have that opportunity at our internet at our fingertips and so that's really amazing and that's one of the things that the uh, Out of Eden Learn community allows for. Um, I have a question about kind of the multi-year aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So he's taking a seven-year journey and Paul mentioned, Paul Allison mentioned earlier that you know his students will be seniors when he's done <laughs> but, um, but I teach students who I'll see again next year and I'll be teaching in a similar um, setting um, do you, how does it work? Um, do you see a, a trajectory of like a student who starts this journey with him, and then also through the years being a part of this? And so then it seems like those steps might change a little bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And you know, I, this is something we're really thinking a lot about, and um, and so. So we have some ideas, but um, at the moment, you know, the the Out of Eden Learn experience is, is oriented around this learning journey that, um, not that people couldn't go through it more than once, but the idea is that most students will go through it once, and then, um, you know, ideally it will have some inform in their thinking about the world. But, but we're trying to think about pathways to continue, and one thought, and we have a um, a lot of students who are, especially the students from India, actually, that Brenda mentioned, um, and and some other students who were in some of the early, early uh, walking parties, who are really interested in playing some sort of role in the community. Um, and so we're, we're thinking about developing um, uh, a trail guides, is our, is our the term we use, um, for these youth who've been a part of Out of Eden Learn and um, can can continue to play a role. And I think that there are, we're not really sure yet how to, how to define that and we may work with youth um, um, to do that. But one, one thought we have is that sometimes even though the, the prompts, the, the footsteps are really, um, they're really provocative, they really are aimed at promoting you know, meaningful reflection and youth are reflecting in meaningful ways, sometimes the dialogue doesn't go as deep as we'd like. So one thought we have is that um, 
we really um, seize on this interest on the part of youth who've been through Out of Eden Learn and really got it and really engaged deeply with it and see if they can play a role in supporting um, conversations between other youth to go deeper, maybe by posing um, meaningful questions here and there. So, so we're really thinking about how youth who've been through it can play roles in it going forward. And we, we certainly are open to suggestions. Perhaps you have some ideas based on your work at Youth Voices. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we at least have the same questions. <laughs> you know, the, so that, you know, a, a student posts, uh, three, three to 40 students respond, but then is there interaction after that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, and but your um, your notion of having this um, place where teachers put open source stuff up sounds great. Um, it sounds like if uh, can students uh, put stuff there too or not? It sounds like if you could open that up to students too. The place where stu where teachers are are post will be able to post work or assignments or ideas or resources. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, sir, you yeah. you cut out there. I'm sorry. Um, I was saying that maybe students could post there as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we have we do have thought about inviting um, you know former or current participants to post some ideas. And towards the end of the learning journey, um, uh, the last the last footstep um, asks students to reflect on their experience and think about designing what kinds of other footsteps they might design uh -huh. going forward, you know, to pursue themselves or to become a part of the Out of Eden Learn community. So that invitation is built in. Um, some youth may want to share it in the in the forum. Other other youth won't. But it's it's part of our ask for participating within Out of Eden Learn. Cool. Um, there's a couple of questions from the chat room. Quickly, and then we should finish. I know. Go ahead. Before yes. you wrap up, the first one was if if it's known like the address of the hangout where Paul uh, is going to be um, including educators? That was a question, and then um, there was another question that about... That was April 29th, you think, but yeah. April 29th. That was the big question, and then um, also, is, is there a way students remain connected with their group after the walk has ended? But that sounds like more of a long answer. It seems like the short answer might be, is there a link that we can give to people for this upcoming Hangout? Or where would they find it on the Out of Eden Learn site? So a couple of um, things. Um, we don't, I just went to our Google Plus page, and we don't have it posted there. But um, follow us on Twitter, Out of Eden Learn, um, and Google Plus. We also have a Facebook page. So those are places where we always post um, upcoming event information. I believe Liz is doing another hangout um, April 17th, if I recall correctly. Um, so before before Paul's um, Paul's hangout, there'll be another one that's more general about Out of Eden Learn, so you can dip into that. Um, but since I don't have the link for that um, that hangout with Paul, just, just go to the Google Plus or Twitter. This is all getting about getting involved with the community, so just you know, join and keep track. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, Brenda, you have any final thoughts tonight? Um, I just, I guess, I wanted to add. Um, well, the only thing I guess I wanted to add was that I think it's a really beneficial opportunity for students, and I think that especially for the younger students, I guess, because they might be able to follow it longer. Last year, I well, for the past two years, but I've been working with students who are in grade 11 or juniors, I guess you call them. Um, and so my students graduate, and I hope that they continue on. And I think one of them is actually going to become a trail guide. She was amazing last year and really mm -hmm. heavily involved. Um, but I think that because they have been involved, some will continue to follow um, Paul's journey well after I won't see them. Maybe at their 10-year reunion we'll talk about it, but um, I, I just think it's such an interesting opportunity at, for them to think about and see even just the idea of doing it and that personal uh, journey that he's taking to retrace the footsteps and you know a lot of them 
reflected even on that as like, wow, what are my questions when I'm thinking about that? And would I have the stamina to do that? Would I have the dedication to do that? And you know, there's other kind of aspects to it, the the cross-curricular component that I see, because of course I'm a social studies teacher, but I appreciate people who are media teachers and English teachers, and one of the other groups at my school this year is an actual ESL um, group who are just, you know, getting a handle on the language um, before they even delve into some of the other skills and content areas at our school. So um, I see the benefits uh, there too for cross-curricular and intercurricular um, communication as well. Mm. Carrie. You have any final thoughts? Thank you, Brenda. Uh, j just that I I love having this dialogue with with you folks at Youth Voices, and it mm -hmm. seems like um, there are a lot of parallels between our, our our goals and and our puzzles. And so I hope the conversation can continue. Cool. Great, Chris. Well, I, I actually got my class signed up, and so we'll be um, doing um, some work tomorrow. They're going to be adding um, some their first footstep and connecting with some students in India, so that's pretty cool. So that is one of the things Youth Voices doesn't have, is a lot of connections outside of the United States, so that's that's really neat. Cool. And I don't think um, Jake got on here. You, no, he didn't, but uh, we'll work on his sound. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jake. Um, another time. So thank you all. Um, do you want to say here um, that uh, we've uh, been doing this for some time every Wednesday night, and uh, welcome back anytime. The uh, we started oh eight years ago um, as a webcast on the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridge Bridges Network, um, and Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier, who are getting back together again. If you haven't heard that on Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern, um, <laughs> uh, are that's uh, those guys started that community. Thank you all um, for tonight. And we'll see you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night.